ability to naturally filter our water. What the most important thing is to filter the water waste so we don't run out of clean water. Yeah, this is what's all a geographic institution last summer. We specifically were getting calls from Canada. There's a lot of spills up in Canada. The Canadian government is being very open, and a lot of the companies want to solve the problems. And their big problem is the tar sands. So we have the same Wabasca crude that is, is here in, in Mayflower. And so we started working in, in the wood, in Woods Hole with scientists developing suspended synthetic eel grass and putting it in the water column. We attempted to deploy this, and we did offer this to Axon uh, and did some testing with them early on in the spill. And what you can see here is it's stopping the oil. It's suspended in the water column, and the oil beyond it is, is the water beyond it is oil free. And this is all documented on a YouTube video, and anybody interested can look at that later. And again, to, to here again, goes back to common sense. If the water column is defined as beneath the surface above the bottom, so you have all these tar sands, oils, and molecules from the Wabasca crude and the Sonoba dilium all floating around and raining, floating around here. If you're going to grab from the surface instantaneously, you're probably not, you're going to get some, you're going to get some of the more volatiles. Or are you going to grab from the middle? What you need is to suspend something in that water column that, can, that mimics a life form or a matrix. And that's where what we have comes in because it attracts the contamination and it repels the water. And for those interested, there are third party white papers written by scientists from the Woods Hall. Go back. Go back. But it's this simple diagram, and if you want to know what's in the water column in the cove and the lake, or in the future, prepared for future spills, to be able to put something in the water that can remove the oil and take advantage of surface area. And what this is, is when we sit around with the scientists, we're, we're really, we, we don't really think we've come up with something that novel, but we're mimicking Mother Nature. Because what are wetlands and eelgrass, and they call it kelp on the West Coast? What are the wetlands? They maximize surface area. There's a reason the old grass exists, because it maximizes surface area. So as we are losing the wetlands uh, and our, the ability from Mother Nature, we, 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 we're trying to come up with a way to replace it by mimicking, mimicking Mother Nature and maximizing surface area. And this is from the Sherry Campbell Bridge, Farm Creek. Uh, and there you see us taking these tentacles and underneath the water to maximize the water flow. This, this, uh, we have hundreds of pages of reports. So these are the our Mayflower water column testing results. And these are by no means definitive. Our recommendation is a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, we've identified local Arkansas people that grew up here that are licensed, certified, that can go on behalf of the community and test at various points in the cove and throughout the main body of the lake. It, uh, go back on what, what I won't spend a lot of time on this. Uh, I'm free to meet afterwards and go through the detailed re reports. But a lot of the standard volatiles, semi-volatiles, those don't show up in the standard re uh, reports because we're in uncharted territory with these tar sands and all these different chemicals. So we're finding very long chain carbons, hydrocarbons, that are showing up as tentatively identified compounds. And that's where we need to focus is what is really in the water, not just the standard list you're looking for. For example, if you know if you're if you're looking for one specific virus and you're not testing for the other, that other virus is still going to contaminate people and get sick. You're not going to know it's there. You know, there's no there. So these are the <coughs> various locations. What we call the subway ditch, Exxon Site B, everyone familiar with that. We, but we went, we fingerprinted things like phenanthrene and some of the different solvents over there, and we matched those up on, on various points in the cove and in the main body of the lake. And I am not a doctor, I'm not an expert in any of this, but I will say uh, we have heard from the uh, Athabasca Indians that have suffered basically in a similar way as Mayflower. And that's why I asked the question about red blood cells. That's what the experts are, are asking me about. And some of the naphthalines we're finding and some of these heavy long chain molecules, some of the semi-volatiles, they, they are um, 
consistent with some of the health effects that they are seeing in the Athabasca River region of Canada, where all of this comes from. And we've got the dam, we found long chain hydrocarbons there, naphthalene, um, methyl esters of acidic acid, I mean, I, yeah, I, I could keep going on all this stuff. And we found different solvents. Now, what some people will come back and say, absolutely, could there be prior contamination? Could somebody have similar oils that are dumping illegally in the lake? That's a possibility. I'm not here to draw that conclusion. But what I can say is the subway ditch is matching up fingerprint-wise with the molecules that we're, we're finding in the main body of the lake. So that there's a strong probability. That's why we need to do more testing in the water. There's a strong harbor probability that's, that's linked to the Exxon pipeline spill. And uh, we've got Mallard Lane, and we actually found a long chain hydrocarbon in a ditch behind, two roads behind Starlight Road. We just got these results back in uh, about 48 hours ago. And we're still analyzing them. But it appears as though there's a lot of heavy solvents, heavy molecules floating up and down the water column. This is April 1st, 2013, when we first arrived on the ground, and that's the subway ditch. And that's deploying, that's when I, I had no idea our stuff would even work on the heavy tar sands and we threw the stuff in the water and it worked. And, and this is what, and again, this, this goes, hold this slide here. Um, this goes to what David was saying. This, again, they don't know, there's never been a spill like this in a suburban area. So they're, they're basically spraying the rocks and spraying the ground like they did in Valdez, you know, 40 years ago. Why aren't they using the best available technology. Um, it's a question that should be asked. And this is how it's moving. You can see this oil. This was taken on April 1st. This is moving from the subway ditch underneath I-40 into the cove and then through the cove into the main body of the lake. And you can see it flowing right underneath, right, right, right by the white brown booms. And the sheen, of, a lot of, you know, it's the sheen and sometimes the clear chemicals that can hurt you more than the dark oil. So it is irresponsible for anybody to say there's no visible oil in the water. You're okay. That, that you know, the, the point is, it, again, like you said, it's the long haul. You have to see the science behind everything, whether it's me saying something or anybody else. Demand answers and ask tough questions. That just shows more. And this, this is Ovi Cambry, uh, who we tested our product with on April 2nd. Uh, 